okay, sorry. Uh, hi folks, uh, welcome back from lunch. Um, we're going to get started with our next panel, um, which is on monitoring human rights obligations. So we have two speakers here in the room, Elizabeth and, whoa, I'm sorry, Magda, I know your name, I just forgot for a second. Um, and then two folks who are joining us online, Sinada and Benafsha. Um, and we're going to have videos from uh, the two folks who are joining us online, um, starting with Sanada, and I'm just going to read out her bio. Uh, so Sanada says, my name is uh, Sanada Halilcevic. I was born in Bosnia and Herzegovina in 1976. Spent most of my life in different institutions. After leaving the institution, I lived in a community-based support housing program in Zagreb, Croatia. Since April the 1st, 2012, I have been living completely independently. I have been president of the Association for Self-Advocacy since 2008. Association for Self-Advocacy was the first association of persons with intellectual disabilities in Croatia and this part of Europe. It was founded in 2003 in Zagreb. I'm a member of the Board of Inclusion Europe and the president of the European Platform of Self-Advocates, EPSA, for two years. And so I am going to hand it over to Sanada or to a video. Good day, everyone. My name is Sanada Halicevic. I come from Zagreb. I have been working for a long time as a self-advocate in a self-advocacy association that deals with the rights of people with intellectual disabilities. I am a member of Inclusion Europe, i.e. the European Platform of Self-Advocates. And I also represent women with intellectual disabilities in the EDF, European Disability Forum, the Women's Committee. Croatia and the European Union have signed the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. But little has changed regarding people with disabilities. Croatia has started working on deinstitutionalization, but in the past two or three years, this process has stalled. People living in organized housing programs still live as if in mini institutions. because there is not enough staff to provide them with support. In organised housing, they still live according to the rules that applied in institutions. They live from 2 to 15 people in the same house. When people want individual support, they cannot have it. As for people who live alone or with their parents, since last year, according to the law, they can have a personal assistant who will help them with daily activities. They can have a personal assistant for a minimum of 88 hours per month. Up to 200 or 300 hours depending on the degree of disability. As of January 1st this year, European disability cards have come into effect. which also help people travel within Europe or their country. However, people living in support services do not have this right. Regarding money, the government has passed a law on an inclusive allowance 
which should help people with disabilities to integrate more easily into the community. People who do not live in the programme have the right to an inclusive allowance. While people living in the programme do not have this right. The government of the Republic of Croatia wanted to align the law on social welfare with Article 12. Of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, so that there is no longer complete deprivation of legal capacity. Now there is only partial deprivation of legal capacity. This means that the court determines what a person can decide on their own and what is decided by the guardian instead. But when we look at the decision about what a person cannot do, we see that it is almost as if that person is completely deprived of legal capacity. Because of this legal capacity, women with disabilities cannot make some decisions on their own. For example, getting married without the guardian's approval. They cannot sign any contract, take out a loan, make decisions about their health, and especially about their reproductive status, whether they will have children and family or not. They are still viewed as if they are children. Two years ago, Inclusion Europe proposed me to be a member of the EDF. This is a women's committee that represents women with disabilities in Europe with different types of disabilities. There are 12 women on the committee. The committee deals with the rights of women with disabilities in Europe. So far, we have worked on various documents, such as a manifesto that talks about the inclusion of women in politics. For example, we noticed that very few women participate in parties and parliaments, especially women with disabilities. Women with disabilities are often discriminated against because they face significant barriers to achieving their women's rights. For example, women without legal capacity cannot find a job and get employed. They cannot have their own money and manage their money and property. This is done by their guardian instead. Especially with women with disabilities, forced sterilization is done to prevent pregnancy.
often without the woman's knowledge. Women with disabilities do not have enough support to complete some education or qualifications to get a quality job and build a career. Therefore, the EDF has written guidelines to empower women to fight for their rights. However, the environment they live in greatly influences their decisions. And does not provide them with enough support to achieve their rights. Women fight through various associations, although associations are mostly funded from project funds. So most of them do not have enough money to organize public campaigns or public advocacy. and thereby influence politics so that women with disabilities achieved their rights. Governments, as well as the European Union, should dedicate more time and attention to this problem. and provide both financial and moral support for the achievement of women with disabilities. And fulfill the rights from the Istanbul Convention. This is very difficult to achieve, an unrealistic expectation because we see that in Europe and Croatia recently, right-wing conservative political parties are strengthening. Therefore, it is necessary for the women of Europe to network and try to fight together against various discriminations, prejudices and violence. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Sonata, for that contribution and for outlining some of the challenges that women with disabilities experience in Croatia and what needs to be changed kind of on a national and also an EU level uh, to access those rights. And I think particularly the, the points around the need for funding and support and collaboration are particularly relevant to some of the conversations that we've had today. Um, we're next going to move on to our second speaker, who is Benasha Yakubi, who is also joining us online. Um, Benasha, Benasha Yakubi is a civic society and human rights activist and a founder of the organization of uh, Rayab for Rehabilitation Services for the Blind in 2008 and an attorney for in the Afghan Attorney General's office from 2017 until 2019. And also also was Afghanistan's independent human rights commissioner, was born in Kabul uh, in Afghanistan. During her activities, both in the government and in the civic society, her main goal has been to advocate for the rights of vulnerable categories of society, including women, children and persons with disabilities. She has two master's degrees, one in political science and another in international relationship relations. And now as a PhD candidate, she's doing her PhD. She's in her second year in an Indian university in the field of political sciences. So I'll hand the floor over to Banasha. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, thanks for listening to me. This is uh, Banasha Yakobi. And I'm a human rights activist and the activist for the rights of people with disability. Um, 
I was in Afghanistan and I'm from Afghanistan, but I'm based in London. Uh, nowadays, unfortunately, I couldn't come to uh, this program to see you all and to meet you all in person, and I had to join you online. So it's a pleasure for me to stand before you and speak with you regarding the uh, UACRPD and its implementation uh, mechanism within our country. Um, Afghanistan uh, ratified the, the Convention on the Rights of People with Disability in 2012. So the ratification of this convention, uh, it didn't happen if the disability stakeholders and people who work for the rights of people with disability inside the country uh, via national and international NGOs and INGOs wouldn't work together shoulder by shoulder with Afghanistan government. So Afghanistan people with disability, they try to uh, advocate for their rights and they try to um, speak up and bring up the issue of people with disability to Afghanistan Republic government. And then after um, a long going and coming, falling and rising, and uh, so after a long while, uh, and after a long, um, continual advocacy, we got successful to um, speak with the former government to ratify the Convention on the Rights of People with Disability, which was really important for us to uh, go on with it. And this uh, convention guarantees, as you all are, you are aware, this guarantees all the uh, human rights of people with disability, including their education rights, including their access to health, um, access to a healthy environment, access to uh, sport, and all, hum of our, all human rights of us are there. So because of this, we try to um, somehow put pressure upon Afghanistan government to uh, accept this all and to ratify the Convention on the Rights of People with Disability. So I'm not going to that story, which will take you uh, time a bit longer. Just I wanted to mention that uh, in Afghanistan, people with disability, they had the main role um, for ratification of this convention by our government. And after that, so we tried, to, we, we had a rule and regular kind of the law uh, for the privilege and the rights of people with disability in Afghanistan. We tried to amend that uh, law uh, to be kind of um, aligned with the Convention on the Rights of People with Disability. Um, it was just not me. We were a network, a big network, named the Advocacy Committee for the Rights of People with Disability and some other disability stakeholders which we work with the um, Ministry of uh, People with Disability and Martyrs and Disabled in Afghanistan. So we all, uh, shoulder by shoulder, went together to amend our uh, law based on this uh, convention. And in Afghanistan, we had um, like uh, two mechanisms for monitoring of the uh, implementation of this, um, I mean, human rights convention. One was the Ministry of Mortal and Disabled, which was a governmental ministry and which worked for the uh, for people with disability. This ministry had the job to uh, monitor all uh, governmental organizations and also non-governmental organizations to see how can they uh, work for people with disability and our, uh, the people with disability rights are, I mean, somehow a hold there from them or not. So uh, this organization or this ministry had a close relationship with different uh, governmental and non-governmental organizations who work for people with disability and even for, with those organizations who didn't have any specific plan to work for people with disability. But uh, this ministry uh, job was that to coordinate with them and to help them to make their plan. For example, if they want to have any uh, plan to make the, uh, some building in the cities or make the, some new hospitals or things like that, they, this uh, ministry had the job to monitor and see how they can consider the accessibility for the for people with disability. I mean, the environmental accessibility or maybe the accessibility for people with sensory disability and all things. Besides that, in 2005, uh, in 2003, uh, the Afghanistan government, based on our constitution, uh, so uh, they made the commission of the, the commission of human rights. 
AIHRC in Afghanistan, Afghanistan Independent Commission of Human Rights was there and in uh, Afghanistan Independent Commission of Human Rights we had a specific department which was monitored and uh, protect and promote the rights of people with disability. So this, uh, um, this commission had the job and duty to see and monitor regarding uh, all uh, governmental and non-governmental organizations, including the Ministry of the uh, Market and Disabled, to see how they are considering the convention uh, articles and how are they working? Are they, is their work aligned with the, con I mean, the convention and how are they doing? And then, uh, so uh, the commission tried to, uh, I mean, we, we every year annually uh, published reports from the uh, human rights situation of people with disability to speak with the governmental and non governmental organization, to speak with Afghanistan people. And we wanted to tell them this is the Convention of the Rights of People with Disability, this is the article, this is the law, this is the rule, and this is the thing that we are doing, this is our strength, and this is our weaknesses points. So I already we published this uh, monitor, uh, monitoring reports, and based on that reports, we tried to advocate for uh, the, I mean, uh, rights of people with disability, and we tried to speak with different um, uh, organizations, and we try to promote and protect the rights of people with disability based on that report, aligned with the, uh, uh, I mean, uh, Convention on the Rights of People with Disability. And after that, we had a plan to make a shadow, shadow report, because unfortunately, after ratification of the uh, Convention, on behalf of Afghanistan Republic government, they didn't try to give a report to CRPD committee. As you are aware, the CRPD committee is an international body for uh, monitoring of the I mean, implication of the uh, Convention on the Rights of uh, People with Disabilities within different countries. But uh, the Afghanistan government didn't submit any report to the that committee. In 2019, uh, we tried to go to the uh, Foreign Ministry of Afghanistan or different ministry of uh, Afghanistan former government when I spoke with them, I said, ask them to at least resubmit your reports. Uh, otherwise, we'll give our shadow reports. And then, so the CRPD committee may uh, have their own decision based on our sh uh, shadow reports. And after that, they uh, may prepare their reports and they submitted their reports to the um, CRPD committee. But, uh, in 2021, after you all are aware, unfortunately, Afghanistan government collapsed, and all these uh, mechanisms and monitoring mechanisms and all of these things have gone. And unfortunately, the um, Taliban de facto government they dissolved the com uh, Commission on the Rights of, uh, I mean, the Human Rights Commission for Afghanistan. So based on that, that a department which was monitored and protect and promote the rights of people with disability, and it was included in the Afghanistan Independent Human Rights Commission was gone. And uh, unfortunately, uh, the nowadays in the Ministry of Mortal and Disabled of Afghanistan, the uh, this ruling system are running that uh, ministry, and the monitoring and kind of investigation of human rights of people with disability keeping very uh, difficult for all people. Uh, although. We have some uh, reports, and we are connected with we are, we are connected with people who are inside the country, and we have uh, I mean relation. We have uh, reports. We have uh, um, something from this from inside the country, but still we can't say that we can do our monitoring as um, good as a kind of um, one a national institution can be. Uh, we have Yunama um, inside the country. Uh, and unfortunately, UNAMA, which is a, a main institution for monitoring of human rights in Afghanistan, uh, even they don't have access to uh, some rural area or far area to see how is the situation of people with disability within the country. But based on our reports, unfortunately, the Afghanistan people with disability are suffering a, um, a lot, and they don't have access to their education, health, justice, labor, and unfortunately to none of their fundamental rights nowadays. Because as you are aware, the de facto government prohibited all girls from going to school upper than grade six. 
So girls and women with disability are uh, not able to go to school. And then they are not able to go to work. They are not continuing their jobs. So based on that, they are somehow uh, experiencing multiple, discrim multiple discrimination based on their gender and their disability as well. And the people who uh, have their own job in the former government, most of them unfortunately are quit from their jobs and uh, they are suffering with a really uh, bad economical issues. And uh, from the other side, the health system of Afghanistan for all people getting uh, very difficult and unfortunately we don't have lots of our um, doctors and professional people and experts uh, immigrated from the country. And the other side, we have the medicine issue. So as you are aware, the rehabilitation and the impairment that uh, disability caused by itself for all people with disability needs lots of treatment and we all need to have good access to health care. Unfortunately, in Afghanistan, the situation is dying and people with disability, they don't have, um, I mean, a proper access to, to, to their, their health right. And unfortunately, besides the other people that they are suffering from not having access to their health right, people with disability are suffering maybe uh, two, two or three times more than them. Uh, and if you come to justice and we think about the people uh, who are inside the country and we see how, if they have access to justice, speak of the judiciary system of Afghanistan or damage is different than before nowadays. So, and the professional judges gone from the country, they immigrated to other countries. And the uh, most important thing is that the approach of right base, which we try to advocate for that uh, within that 20 years leading up to 2021 has gone. And this approach changed to a kind of sympathy uh, approach, which is not right based and which is not human rights based. So this is the main issue which we have inside the country. And unfortunately, the monitoring and the investigation uh, of implementation of their uh, convention is not clear for us. And from the other side, the de facto government didn't mention anything officially they, that they accepted the Convention of the Rights of People with Disabilities. So still, it's like a darkness and we don't know where are we. Uh, I mean, even there is no way to ask from them that why you are not, uh, I mean, implementing the convention because they didn't say that they are uh, committed with the convention, although they have some formal government ratified that, but still not just regarding the convention of the rights of people with disability, but beside that, regarding the other convention, uh, such as CEDA, they are not committed to that and they are not saying that they will implement this, which is a bit difficult and tiring for us. And uh, so uh, I hope for a brighter world for uh, all people with disability and for people with disability in my land as well. Many thanks for your uh, kind attention. I will remain in your disposal. If you have any question, I'll be here to respond. Thank you very much. Thank you, Benafsha, for um I suppose outlining the situation for disabled people in Afghanistan and the mechanisms that were at one point at one point in time in place. And I suppose it's a it's a reminder that we need to kind of remember that progress is not always a straight line and we have to be vigilant. Um and that things can change as as governments and systems change. Um uh and we have to always sort of be aware of that and remember it. Uh we're now gonna turn to the two panelists that we have in the room and we're gonna start off with Magda. Um so if you'd like to I can introduce you. Um, so, uh, Dr. Magda Zorata, no, Chirata, I'm not, my Polish is terrible, I'm sorry, <laughs> um, is a senior research associate at Lancaster University in the UK and is an award winning cross sectional strategist and human rights advocate with over 15 years of experience across Europe, Asia, and the US, and is also a photographer and poet, which is very cool. Considered one of the pioneers of the disabled women's movement in post-socialist Poland, she has been engaged in effective policy-related advocacy and expert interventions in the European Union and the United Nations. Dr. Chirata, Chirata has co-authored and authored books, journal articles, reports and change-making tools and has led and co-led research and advocacy projects on technologies for innovative social change, impact and outreach. She's received merit-based scholarships and advocacy fellowships from Yale, U Yale University, 
the Kosuko Foundation, uh, the Ashoka Foundation and the Alliance Foundation, among others. And in 2019, she was honoured with the title of Ambassador for the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities in recognition of her contributions in the realm of disability and intersectional justice. And her academic and advocacy work has gained media attention in English, French, Polish, Czech and Nepalese. Thank you so much. I don't know which uh, mic is working. Can you hear me? Should I? Yep. Yeah? Yep. Both? Yep. All right, cool. So <laughs> thank you so much for the invitation for the, for the summer school. Um, and I'm really glad to be back. Um, and I also wanted to say that I'm still extremely moved uh, by the keynote by Rosaline and the response by Emmy. Uh, it was truly an iconic moment. So again, bravo, thank you for that. Um, so I've been asked to share my first-hand experiences as an activist and researcher with disabilities, which I gained while engaging with the UN mechanisms. And specifically, um, I want to highlight a case from 2018, uh, when uh, alongside other Polish disability advocates and our allies, we developed an effective strategy addressing the disproportionate discrimination faced by women and girls with disabilities um, in Poland, an issue that the Polish state has largely overlooked, to say the least, uh, despite its ratification of, for instance, CEDA and CRPD. And importantly, my goal is, goal is not just to explain what we did, uh, but also to use an example from Poland to identify some questions worth keeping in mind more generally while navigating the UN system, which offers, as you know, various paths of engagement. Uh, some feasible um, for specific states and uh, some paths are more realistic given the resources you and your networks might have. And I'm aware uh, that you may already have various experiences with the UN, though no matter uh, where you are in the process of engaging with it, uh, the key message I wish to uh, convey is that we should consist consistently remind ourselves that irrespective of our education, educational or other backgrounds, uh, or years of experience, um, advocacy experience, we have every right to be the part of the UN ecosystem. Uh, and we should assert our place there, uh, shape ongoing debates, utilize human rights tools, but also urge funders to support our advocacy efforts so that we can fully and accessibly engage in, deci in decision-making processes. And looking some years back, um, I wish someone had supported me, um, a young activist and also my fellow activists, in claiming our space in the human rights sector. Back then, at least in Poland, human rights processes seemed reserved mainly for, for human rights lawyers or policymaking experts. Although they occasionally address disability issues in their re reporting and monitoring, they offer marginalized not only discrimination faced by us disabled women and girls, but also our grassroots evidence um, of such discrimination, such as first-hand testimonials or our do-it-yourself um, small-scale research. And back then, uh, we were told that such knowledge making was merely anecdotal evidence, not rigorous enough. And meanwhile, the majority of academics had also focused on disability issues, however, without an intersex intersectional perspective and a human rights angle. And fast forward to 2018, and a significant breakthrough occurred regarding the issues faced by Polish women with disabilities, which in fact also gained wide media attention in Poland. So what happened? By the end of that year, the UN Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities issued concluding observations on Poland, emphasizing the urgent need for the Polish state to address violations of the human rights of disabled Polish women. The committee recommended prioritizing issues faced by disabled women and girls, Article 6, alongside other disability policy concern, independent living, Article 19. Furthermore, the committee required the Polish state to actively and meaningfully involve organizations representing women with disabilities in consultations, and I uh, quote, when designing new laws and strategies to ensure that legislation complies with the convention, end of quote. Importantly, 
The recommendations included a considerable number of references, over 40, to the rights of girls and women with disabilities. And they cover critical areas such as protection against violence, sexual and reproductive rights, poverty reduction, employment, and access to justice and redress. A, gra a groundbreaking aspect from our perspective was also the emphasis on incorporating an intersectional approach into all disability-related state actions. And for our community of activists with disabilities and our allies, it was truly a moving moment because it turned out that all those previously dismissed efforts, our knowledge making, accumulating documentation, gathering testimonials, were legitimized and seen as valid by the committee. Moreover, what was also a game changer for us was that the committee, chaired by the Professor Theresia Degener, with Professor Jonas Ruskus serving as Poland's country rapporteur, they engaged with us seriously, recognizing our expertise and lived experience on the issues we have dealt with for years. But before all that happened, we had to ask ourselves a question, which you might also already be asking uh, yourselves. That big question, which advocacy strategy should we pursue? Which UN path should we engage with? And surely, to make an informed decision, one must understand the various paths available, including their entry points and accessibility throughout the year, as well as whether they are subject to a quite strict UN calendar. While these factors may initially seem complex, especially for those of us who are not human rights lawyers, there are numerous opportunities to gain uh, know-how, including this summer school. My personal journey in understanding the possibilities within the UN was greatly facilitated by already mentioned by Sheila, Women Enabled International, um, when I took part in 2016 in their uh, international gather gathering of advocates, uh, which was uh, led by now retired uh, Stephanie Orteleva, um, and that event provided us uh, with access to UN experts, for instance. And importantly, and this is something, an information for you to remember, Women Enabled International still have great resources available online, fact sheets, toolkits. Uh, they are also mapping various disability organizations worldwide, and they're really helping in helping all the networking uh, around the UN to happen. So I really um, recommend you get in touch with them. So assuming you are already aware of the available options, is that enough to attempt a meaningful advocacy within chosen UN path and strategy? Well, at least from our Polish experience, it is not sufficient, because I would also suggest considering additional questions concerning your national context, specific political situation, regional considerations, and broader issues. They, uh, these include, for instance, potential allies in your social justice movement, both nationally, but also internationally. Uh, you can also see whether your ombudsman office is active in disability rights issues or not. Also, it is important to see um, the roles that specific, for instance, UN treaties play within your movements historically, serving as potential catalysts for mobilizations. And I will illustrate this point of needing to keep both the UN context and your country context in mind when choosing choosing a strategy on the case of Poland. So in, in our case, our chosen course of action involved engaging with the CRPD as a treaty, as well as the CRPD committee as its governing body. From our perspective, I would argue there were at least three main reasons behind this decision. First, the historical context was crucial. Despite Poland having ratif ratified CEDA, Polish women with disabilities have often found themselves sidelined within the mainstream feminist movement that primarily utilized CEDA in its advocacy efforts. In contrast, the grassroots movement that pushed for Poland's adoption and ratification of the CRPD involved sustained efforts of dedicated adv advocates, including women with disabilities and our allies. So this underscore, underscores the CRPD not only as a legal document, but as a potent symbol of rights and our empowerment, which was capable of galvanizing meaningful action. Similarly, the Polish Ombudsman Office has long served as a crucial ally for people with disabilities. However, their focus on disability rights of women with disabilities has primarily aligned with the principles of the CRPD, 
rather than integrating a more intersectional approach with CEDA-related advocacy. Secondly, the timing for using CRPD was ideal for us. By 2018, we had gathered strong support from allies and solid evidence. This moment presented a strategic opportunity to ensure that issues affecting disabled women would receive proper attention within the UN framework. And thirdly, there was a broader effort within the disability community to prepare a thorough shadow report covering all aspects of the CRPD. This report had the potential to be important for raising various concerns. However, we were aware of its limitations, such as page constraints and the potential for certain is issues, especially those concerning disabled women, to, to be not taken up widely as they should be. Additionally, we anticipated the state's official reporting to be dismissive of women, with, of women and girls with disabilities. And all that motivated us to utilize every available method. Uh, we contributed to the wider, uh, wider disability community alternative uh, report, but also created two focused shadow reports, one on women and girls with disabilities, co-written by Amanda Macri from Women Enabled International and myself, and another on LGBTQ plus issues and disabilities, which was prepared by the amazing Venus de Milo Zone associations and their institutional allies. So our collective goal was to ensure that these vital issues were prioritized during Poland's reporting to the CRPD committee. In essence, our decision to focus on the CRPD was strategic, not only in relation to the UN system, but also in how it was tied to the broader disability human rights ecosystem back in Poland. Um, so, while participating in the treaty body state reporting cycles offers a critical opportunity for advocacy, another question arises: Should you prepare? Should you prepare and present a comprehensive overview of uh, the human disability rights situation in your country, or should you delve deeply into specific issues, or maybe something else? And this is a vital dilemma, especially given um, given that as disability advocates. We have very limited resources, not only financial, but also in terms of energy and time, etc. Therefore, we need to strategize how to effectively use our limited resources. And from my discussions with Polish and international fellow advocates, it is evident that effective advocacy assists treaty committees in understanding the nuanced operations of discriminatory systems and mechanisms in a given country and also wider region, in our case, Eastern European region. This necessitates more than statistical data, which can be scarce, actually, when it comes to disabled women, and aggregated quantitative evidence. It is essential to somehow convey the lived experiences of women and girls with disabilities and gender minorities, bringing these stories to life and providing a platform for their perspectives and recommendation that they also offer. The importance of this approach cannot be overstated because the experience and definition of disability, as we all know, evolves over time and is very contextual and context-specific. So your evidence should be then multi-layered to effectively, to effectively counter, state, to counter state reports that may avoid difficult questions. And I'll give you an example. Uh, in the Polish case, the state during the monitoring stated um, multiple times uh, constitutional gender equality to claim that women with disabilities face no particular issues, thereby uh, sidestepping the actual challenges they encounter. And adding, de adding depth to your reporting is achievable, for example, by adopting, adopting an intersectional approach to disproportionate discrimination, to echo what already uh, Teresa Degener uh, and Maria Laura Serra said um, in the previous panel. So this involves showcasing diverse experiences and the intersecting exclusionary processes such as various isms, ableism, sexism, racism, ageism, etc. And embracing intersex intersectionality can mean also that although your advocacy may focus on the CRPD, you should also draw on experiences and references from other shadow reporting and, advo and advocacy around, for, for instance, SIDA. Using evidence intended for women's issues can bolster advocacy for women with disabilities. And intersectionality requires also building strategies and gathering evidence across different sectors. So collaborate with lawyers, policymakers, but also various types of advocates, activists, etc. To sum up, I want to highlight an important issue that often arises in discussions with my fellow activists, whether we should reconsider 
how we engage with the UN system. Specifically, there seems to be a growing need for us to embrace an even more intersectional and accessible approach to our UN advocacy. And as food for thought in this regard, I would like to conclude with a really powerful quote from Eleanor Lisney, a founding member of Sisters of Frida, an experimental collective of disabled women and experience, uh, who is also experienced in uh, UN advocacy. And during one of those summer schools here in Galway, uh, she provided a very apt and thought-provoking explanation of what intersectionality is for her. And Eleanor said, I'll quote, Intersectionality is like eating at many tables because of many identities you have, but never really being invited to sit at any of them properly because you are always at the other tables as well. You are not truly accepted or accommodated. Thank you. Thank you very much, Magda, for that contribution. Um, as somebody who I think one of the most important things that I have learned from this is that we have to assert our place in the UN. Um, and I think sometimes the UN is, is such a powerful system, but also can be a little bit intimidating. Um, so I think the advice that you have, um, I, I've written a lot of notes myself, I'm not going to lie, um, will be really helpful to people here. So thank you. Um, our final speaker for this session, before we move on to questions, is Elizabeth, is Elizabeth Kamundia. Um, Elizabeth it works as a Deputy Director of the Disability Rights Division at Human Rights Watch. She holds an LLD from the Faculty of Law in the University of Pretoria and an LLM from here, the CDLP, in NUIG. Elizabeth has worked with the Kenya, uh, Kenya National Commission on Human Rights, the Centre for Disability Law and Policy, and the Centre for Human Rights University of Pretoria. She's also worked at the Commission on the Implementation of the Constitution of Kenya as a consultant on disability, and the Committee of Experts on the Constitutional Review in Kenya. And Elizabeth is an advocate of the High Court of Kenya. And I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. Um, good afternoon, everybody. I'm really, really pleased to be here today. It's always such a pleasure to come back to Galway, um, not only because it's beautiful, but also because I was part of the inaugural class of students, LLM in International and Comparative Disability Law and Policy class of 2012. And so it does feel like coming home. Um, it is here that I built the foundation for the work that I have done on disability rights ever since, supported in the learning by the wonderful faculty here. And so there is always, I come back with gratitude. I also come back for inspiration because I just find summer school so amazing in the sense of um, the, converse, the side conversations that we have in the different place, spaces over tea, in craft is seem in the different spaces that we have. I always live empowered and, and inspired. Um, moving on now to the presentation that I have today, I wanted to mention, of course, I work at Human Rights Watch and um, Human Rights Watch is a global human rights institution that investigates um, and reports on human rights violations around the world. We are a group, we are around 550 staff of over 70 nationalities working um, with communities most at risk. Um, we, we are organized both thematically and geographically. So you will have the thematics including disability rights division, uh, LGBT division, women's rights, children's rights, so along those themes, as well as geographically, so there's Africa division, Europe and Central Asia, like, you know, across, you know, across the world. Um, having said that, I'll go into... The clicker is um, clicking now. Um, so I'd like to talk about how we approach monitoring of human rights um, at Human Rights Watch. And I'll begin by just making sure that we are um, defining it, you know, or at least that you're aware of the way I'm defining monitoring as, as, as we go along. 
we draw our work from Article 33.3 of the CRPD, which says that civil society, in particular persons with disabilities and their representative organizations, shall be involved and participate fully in the monitoring process. And we, you know, obviously are not an organization of people with disabilities, but we are a mainstream human rights organization that has a dedicated unit within it. Um, so a civil society organization that has a dedicated unit that deals with rights of people with disabilities. And we take monitoring to mean a range of steps, and I'm defining this based off of the OHCHR document from a couple of years ago that defined monitoring as a process in which you collect information, you carry out legal and information analysis, um, documentation and reporting, and then you take corrective action and follow up. So kind of a cycle. And um, so that, that, that's where I'm, I'm coming from. And then in terms of monitoring disability rights at Human Rights Watch, the methodology that we use at, at Human Rights Watch is true across all human rights like investigations, right? So it's not specific to disability. We, our methodology is to investigate, to expose, and to change. By investigate, we mean looking into the human rights, uncovering the facts, right? Either being on the ground or virtually as the case may be, particularly in conflict prone areas. Um, uh, so just uncovering the facts is the investigation part. And then exposing, this is where we use the media, including traditional media as well as social media to show what's happening. And then change is where we engage with governments, uh, with businesses, with re rebel groups, depending on the situation, in order to to advocate for changes in advocacy, in laws, and the implementation thereof. So that's the methodology. It's to investigate, to expose, with the goal of, of, of changing things. Um, so then I'll, I'd like to go to take that sort of abstract into a particular context. And I'd like to share um, research that we've done on shackling or chaining of people with mental health conditions in Indonesia to then kind of show that methodology in action and to, to, to show what it is that we do. Um, so, I mean, broadly, when it comes to investigation, um, investigating violations of human rights against people with disabilities, there's sort of like those steps, right? There's interviews, and these are typically the most important, and they include a broad range of stakeholders, but most importantly, people with disabilities, and depending on the situation across the diversity of disability, then there's reviewing laws and policies, reviewing state programs, including budgetary allocations, depending on the question, uh, reviewing decisions of judicial bodies, and reviewing media reports. And I'll apply that now to the specific case of shackling in Indonesia. And just to make sure we are on the same page on shackling, we... Yes, exactly. Um, shackling or chaining is the practice of confining a person's arms or legs using a manacle or a feta to restrict movement. Sometimes chains are used, um, actual metal chains, and it's typically used um, against people with psychosocial and intellectual disabilities, typically in non conventional healthcare settings, so prayer camps, he, traditional healing centers. And it's, we, we did a global report on this in 2020, and we found it across 60 countries globally. So it's not, uh, it's not a specific, um, it's not an isolated case, but is rather quite widespread. Um, so in the case of, of Indonesia, you know, um, we did interviews, and this, this, this is a report that we released in 2016. We did the research over a two-year period, released the report in 2016. Um, it involved interviews with over 149 people, including 72 people with disabilities, um, family members, caregivers, faith healers, lawyers, 
consultations with organizations of people with disabilities. So kind of that's the approach that, that we take to the work. Um, in the interviews, we documented, so it, it will be useful to show an image, and I will show that in the next slide, and maybe I go there just to make sure we are all clear on chaining. Um, I'll describe what's on the page is um, a young woman, 24 year old, um, a female resident in one of the, the healing centers in Java that we found in central Java. And, you know, um, you will um, on the right hand side, you will see that she's lying on a um, sort of wooden makeshift bed with a chain around her ankle that restricts movement and her hand is also tied with a cloth on the extreme end and so so this is a photo taken taken you know there in Indonesia and now that we have a sense of what it is I can then go on to describe um you know, the, the steps and, and how we go about the, the monitoring work. So here we did interviews, as I mentioned, um, we found that in over half the, play, the prayer camps we went to, men and women were chained next to each other. I have seen this also with my own eyes in Ghana, sort of places where men and women are confined next to each other who have psychosocial disabilities. Male staff would enter and exit women's wards or sections at will, including at night. Um, there were cases of staff give, giving women contraception without their knowledge and so, you know, inherently without their consent. And I think this ties in to Teresa's um, presentation earlier today about the specific harms that women with disabilities face in terms of violence, um, in terms of the reproductive angle um, and in terms of discrimination more broadly. So, you know, interviews then are a big part of our methodology. Then we review laws and policies. In the case of Indonesia, it was the Mental Health Act of 2014, which allows a family member or guardian to admit a child or an adult with a psychosocial disability without their consent to an institution without any judicial review. Um, you know, but, you know, this applies to the more formal situation in terms of psychiatric facilities, but you can see that what the law does is already, yeah, already take away the requirement that people should consent to treatment from, to mental health treatment um, per se. And then the third, uh, one other aspect of it is reviewing state programs. So we will look at what programs exist. Um, these are, uh, um, a, a, a policy from 2014 titled Indonesia Free from Pasung. Pasung is the name for shackling. Um, and, and, and then the, there's the mandatory national health insurance system, which aimed to reach universal coverage, making medical care, including mental health care, available to all by 2019. So essentially we will look at different policies and programs that exist within a country so that we can understand more broadly what, what the state is offering or not offering. And then uh, we will review decisions of judicial bodies, more recently the um, Indonesian Civil Code. Um, so Article 433 of the Indonesian Civil Code allows for people with psychosocial or intellectual disabilities to be stripped of their legal capacity and placed under guardianship. And one of our partners, um, the Indonesian Mental Health Organization, together with allies, took a case to court Recently, I think it was last year, challenging this provision. And the end result is that while the court did not, the constitutional court did not abolish guardianship entirely, um, it um, did away with um, plenary guardianship. And so it, it's not that, you know, it's better, but at least it, it reduced the possibility that um, it, you would automatically be under guardianship on the basis of having a diagnosis of uh, a mental health 
condition or an intellectual disability. And then we also review media reports. We corroborate uh, claims via, via media reports as well. I mentioned this, so that was the investigate part. This is the expose part, uh, usually through media, social media, as, 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 as I mentioned. Uh, once we have the report, we then it will be picked up by national media, by international media, and it's a way to put pressure. It's an additional way that we put pressure on, on government. And then change the most, the easiest part, right? <laughs> no, not at all. Um, like the most difficult part, of course, advocating for, no, just change, advocating for change at the international and national level. And I'd like to, um, I'd like to highlight uh, an approach that we are taking with Indonesia and with a couple of other countries is to um, ad approach advocacy for change, both at national level and at international level. At international level, we've been really consistent in making submissions and ensuring that we include the issue of chaining and shackling in submissions across different UN bodies, right? So if there's an opportunity and typically because um, obviously Human Rights Watch works on a number of different issues, um, our submissions will be submissions that include uh, a, a women's rights angle, a children's rights angle. And so when it comes to a disability rights angle, we will put in, in and we have put in in the case of Indonesia, the issue of chaining um, because we want to get concluding observations that are good on this and because we want different government agencies to be involved and to take responsibility for ending chaining. So I'll just read out um, what's on the, on, the, on, the, on the slide on the basis of a, a submission that we did to CEDO and the concluding observation therefrom um, the health section of the health section of the concluding observation addressed shackling and detention of people with intellectual and psychosocial disabilities, um, and recommendations included abolishing the privation of liberty based on actual or perceived intellectual or psychosocial impairment, exam and examinations or treatment without their free and informed consent and investigating, prosecuting, and punishing cases of chaining and detention in private homes and forced placement and treatment in psychiatric facilities. So we have a really good, solid recommendation from the CEDO committee. Um, we then also put in um, a submission to the CRPD committee, and we have concluding observations that address the deprivation of um, liberty based on impairment and expl explicitly mentioned shackling, seclusion and restraints against people with psychosocial disabilities, recommending that this be prohibited and complaints mechanisms be established. It also, also mentioned our forced medical interventions and the lack of a deinstitutionalization strategy. So quite comprehensive. Um, this year we put in... Um, the chaining issue in our economic, social and cultural rights reporting, the civil and political rights reporting, and on the rights of the child, because we also have children who are chained, unfortunately. And so we are awaiting concluding observations on this. And then finally, on at national level, um, we obviously, na nothing about us without us is a key principle in how we work. So we work with local partners who have been advocating for the inclusion of people with disabilities in various policies and programs more broadly. And um, together we uh, have successfully managed to have mental health included in a community outreach program which goes house to house, collecting data, raising awareness, providing services relating to 12 measures of family health and mental health is included. And the program is at scale, right? It reaches, you know, um, millions of households. And so it's a way in which we have seen sort of change come, of course, in, in partnership with, with local groups. Um, and so, yes, thank you. Thank you very much.